What was your reaction then when you heard about the, uh, the twin bomb blasts and the casualties? I mean, profound sadness. Uh, as somebody who served in my country's military, uh, my heart goes out to the family members of those who were killed today, uh, to the fellow members of their unit, who I can only imagine what they're all going through right now. Um, and, you know, a sense that all of this was avoidable if we had simply conducted this withdrawal and an evacuation of these people months ago, uh, well before the fighting season kicked in, well before the Afghan government had collapsed, well before we had withdrawn the majority of our forces and given up the, you know, the bulk of the airfields in the country. If we had simply conducted the evacuation back in February when we first pled with the administration to do so, I can't help but wonder how many of those Marines would still be alive today. Mm. Um, the evacuation flights are, are still <clears throat> ongoing by uh, U.S. forces. What are your fears for those flights that are, are still to take off? And for also, how many people do you hope will be able to be evacuated from Afghanistan? I'm not optimistic we're taking much of anyone else at this point. Uh, from my understanding is if you're not on the airbase, there's a really good chance you're not going to get out. Mm. I know the president committed to continuing the evacuation, but we had already transitioned to what's called a retrograde at this point. A retrograde is a, a withdrawal uh, while still trying to maintain the force in the footprint that you have uh, and sort of a defensive posture. I, I get that they're going to try to evacuate people as they withdraw, but from my understanding, given the number of U.S. forces that had been surged in Afghanistan to facilitate this evacuation, it was likely going to take about 96 hours to withdraw those forces. Uh, if you look at the calendar, that puts us right in line with the 31st deadline that the Taliban have imposed upon us. So I, I, I get that they're going to try to evacuate people as they pull the U.S. military out, but for the vast majority of the Afghans, who are on the ground and had yet to make it into the airport, they're not going to be taken. And so we've done the, the math. Our fear is that we're in line to leave behind around 175,000 people. And how much, uh, Matt, is the U.S. military relying on, on the Taliban to provide security around the airport for these U.S. Evac evacuation flights to succeed, those that, that do manage to get off the ground? I mean, that's the, been the, the hardest pill of all of this to swallow, is that the Taliban have had complete control of the perimeter around the air, airport. You know, if you're an Afghan or a foreign national that's been trying to get from Kabul proper into the airport, you've had to run the gauntlet of Taliban checkpoints, then the mass of humanity that's desperate to get into the, the airport itself, a thin line of the remnants of the Afghan National Army and Afghan National Police that had chosen to remain on duty and try to assist U.S. forces with maintaining some semblance of order. And then there's blast walls and manning those, you know, the, the, the fighting positions in those blast walls, the towers and, and the actual walls themselves were, rem, you know, members of the U.S. military. Uh, where this attack occurred today was the one place where the U.S. military actually met the sea of humanity. From my understanding, it was a suicide bomber that blew themselves up while they were being searched uh, for weapons and bombs and materials. And the reality is that that will always be the most difficult and dangerous uh, position to serve in in an operation like this. There, there really probably isn't anything that any security posture could have done to mitigate that type of risk, given the, the size of the crowds the chaos of the environment uh, and the fact that the vast majority of the people who were probably killed today had been in line for days. Um, they, these, you know, that's what makes this so tragic is that these were people who had been desperate to get into an airbase, had been hoping that they'd be able to get, you know, pass all of the, the, the horrors that they had to experience to get there, had finally gotten up to within sight of the U.S. military. And from their standpoint, just figured, well, if I just don't get out of line, if I just stay here, this is probably my best shot. And now they're dead. And would you say, Matt, that more attacks are inevitable before that deadline, deadline of midnight on Tuesday when U.S. troops are to be withdrawn? I don't know if they're inevitable, but I certainly don't trust the Taliban. I mean, let, let's be clear. Everyone's been saying that it was ISIS Khorasan that, that conducted this attack. But the Haqqani Taliban, who are now responsible for the security around the airport, 
have a very close relationship with ISIS-K and have on many occasions jointly operated together. For those of us who have been paying attention to Afghanistan, and you know this has been our issue for, for years, any one of us will tell you that nothing goes on in Kabul without the Haqqanis knowing about it. So uh, here's what you, your viewers need to realize. It was just a week ago that the Taliban, within the last two weeks that the Taliban took control of the prisons that are both inside Kabul and at Bagram. At those facilities where, where the ISIS fighters who may have conducted this attack were likely being held over the last couple of years, it was Taliban senior leadership who now are in charge of the country who chose to release those fighters. You got to wonder how much of this did they know about ahead of time. Mm. President Joe Biden made a national address today. Uh, Matt, what did you make of his reaction and response to these bombings on the face of it? Pretty hard line, vowing to hunt down those responsible and make them pay. Uh, it's exactly the type of uh, tone that the president needed to speak. You know, for those of us who have been watching just aghast that we've continued to seemingly let the Taliban dictate both the pace, the time, and uh, seemingly even the scale of this withdrawal. I mean, the fact that they've been responsible for determining who is allowed to get to the airport for now the better part of five days. Um, it was finally nice to hear the president stand up and say, no, we are the United States of America. We're not going to be bullied. We're not going to be pushed around. But I have to question just how much bite actually comes with that bark. If we are truly going to withdraw the, the, the majority of our forces, you know, within the next four to five days, I remember the last time we tried to have over the horizon strike capabilities in Afghanistan. It was in the late 90s. You might recall that in 1998, Al Qaeda attacked two US embassies in Africa and our nation's response to those attacks were to send cruise missiles into Afghanistan with the hopes of killing the perpetrators of those Africa embassy bombings, Osama bin Laden and his, his crew. The cruise missiles absolutely hit the targets that they were intended to strike. It was an Al Qaeda training base uh, inside Afghanistan. But by the time they hit the base, bin Laden and his team were long gone. They had fled hours prior. And so that's the reality is that once we leave Afghanistan in a couple of days, the closest U.S. forces are going to be on an aircraft carrier somewhere in the Indian Ocean, 1,200 miles away from anywhere in Afghanistan. I don't know how much that actually truly gives us an immediate strike capability like we do right now to actually hunt down and bring to justice people who perpetrate attacks against the United States and its friends. Matt Zeller. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.